Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning to you though, that are worshiping with us online this morning. Uh, it's a rainy day here in Discovery Bay, and I can kind of tell we've got mostly our Discovery Bay people here today, and maybe a few from Brentwood that decided to trust out and move out there. But uh, for those of you watching us online, if you've ever been in California after the first rain of the year, you never want to be on the roads. So just reminding you on that. Uh, so it's kind of always a fun little escapade to do. So just a few announcements this morning. If you can't tell, AGC has been pretty busy over this last week. Right here in the sanctuary, um, we had elections. And if you want a chance to be able to see how politicians really should do campaign speeches, go to our YouTube page and watch it there. We uh, recorded it, put it out on YouTube. These kids were absolutely amazing. President, Vice President, Secretary, and Treasurer, and then they also had a few of the representatives for the third grade class that wanted to speak in front. And so we had this stage full of all the kids. They, they were doing their speeches. It was amazing. Voting was Friday. Uh, announcement of who won will be Monday. Well, what, voting was Monday or? Yeah, voting was Friday and the announcement will be on Monday. Um, and so that'll be neat. But it was, it's been four years since we've had an opportunity because uh, for a while we didn't have fourth and fifth grade, and now we've got our fourth and fifth grade back. Then COVID happened, all, you know, all kinds of crazy things. So it just felt really fun. So that's on there. And if you were walking in and had enough time to be able to see out in the narthex, Miss V's first grade class had a reading assignment. And then she asked them to take some of the characters from the book they were reading and make them into a pumpkin character. So if you, if you didn't get a chance before worship to see it, stop by. A look at the table, it is absolutely a hoot for some of them on there. And I can tell all of them have more artistic ability than I do. So that's kind of a, a really neat thing there to, to be able to see. Um, and mm, I was going to say, okay, so I'm Pastor Doug when the AGC kids come along, but it's Miss Diana because Schoonover is too long to say. So Miss Diana has an announcement for AGC as well, which includes you guys because it's a fun one. <laughs> You can take your mask off if you want. Good morning, everybody. I'm sure you're familiar with this, but it is cookie dough fundraiser time. And we have um, not just cookies, but we have um, uh, breads and cheesecake. So if you need anything to take with you on the holidays, um, this is a great opportunity. It raise, it's one of our biggest fundraisers that we do for the school. We have 158 students, and uh, we have a lot of technology needs. So a lot of the um, uh, profit from this will go towards buying more Chromebooks, charging stations, projectors. Um, now that we have a fourth and fifth grade, we um, need more equipment. So um, I will have this after church if you guys want to sign up, or you can come in during the week, and uh, Mary will help you um, uh, uh, place an order also. And if you're online and you live close by, um, you are more than welcome to stop by the church office. The orders will be placed. Um, the closing of this event is November 3rd. Cookie pickup will be November 16th, and it needs to be picked up that day because we have nowhere to store the, um, the cookie dough. Any questions? All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Now, for those of you, if you've never used the cookie dough before, this is probably the best cookie dough you could ask for because it's not been frozen for three or four months before you buy it. Um, it's made, then they package it, then they send it off. That's kind of how it is. So it's, it's fresh. Uh, the only freezer that really hits for the longest amount of time is yours if the cookies last that long to make it to the freezer. Usually you want to open the box, test the cookie out, and you sit here and go, I wonder what it's like on the baking sheet, and then before you know it, the cookies are all gone. But anyhow, sorry, that was just talking about if, if it's at our house. But any, if it's like, if your house is like our house, as soon as you start baking them, that's the great thing. Now on to church stuff. We've had a lot of stuff here. You guys notice, those of you who are here today, you didn't have to walk in with any buckets, right? Because we've had our first rain, and everything with the roof is doing awesome. So, um, you know, if the winds pick up, we shouldn't hear any creaks and groans off the north side here. So we're really, really happy. Uh, to kind of get an idea of where we're at with the fundraising for that, you can look at the, um, at the, uh, the thermometer that we have out in the uh, in the narthex there that'll kind of show you where we're at on the fundraising so that is amazing as well um, so no buckets 
Wednesday night, we started the Growing for God building campaign. As you can tell, that's right here. Uh, Julie Knittel, one of, one of the campaign chairs, created this wonderful... She didn't want to do just a thermometer. You know Julie. She's, our, she's the artsy-partsy uh, of, of, of the school, the art, art uh, docent. And so it's actually a vine. Uh, and it's showing how, how everything is growing. Um, the scripture that uh, Kelly used for, for Wednesday night was the scripture uh, where the, the widow is asked, what do you have to be able to give? And all she had was flour and oil, and it kept giving and kept giving and kept giving. And so that was the idea for the vine coming out of there. It's basically an olive branch uh, coming through there. Uh, the goal in the end um, is $2 million, and we have 126000 so far uh, right on that. And that's for the, uh, for the trailers out here. The ARC, which will become the all-purpose room, uh, which actually is two rooms, will be divided. And then this trailer will be removed out here, the third, fourth, and fifth grade trailer, because the classrooms will now be over there. So that is the goal. The great thing is it expands space for us as the church to be able to offer for our AA groups, Al-Anon, and other groups that may want to, to uh, use facilities as well. And so it's a, it's a win-win out there. On YouTube as well, if you didn't get a chance to be in person, uh, several of you here today were in person, so thank you for coming. Uh, but for those of you that didn't, didn't get a chance, uh, the whole presentation is on YouTube, and we'll be able to do that. And if you look at the weather forecast, and I'm going to trust the weatherman. I know you're not supposed to, right? But, but I am on this one because next Sunday is our family Sunday, and the weather's supposed to be really, really nice, so it can rain cats and dogs today. Uh, next Sunday, it'll be that. And... Um, Tina is not here today. Uh, she's uh, visiting one of her daughters in Texas. Uh, but we have one more table that needs somebody to sit at it to be able to hand out candy. So if you like candy, uh, you have an opportunity, you know, to be able to hand it out to the kids, get to know the kids, the families, and that. And so uh, if it's all in the sign-up sheet out in the narthex, so please be able to do that. And then finally, our... La our um, packing party for Operation Christmas Child will be November 7th. So it's just kind of like we just kind of go. There's always something going on here now, uh, which is nice to be able to see after uh, talking to an empty room for almost a year. This is so nice to have you all here, but also it's nice to see the activity on the campus between the school and the church. And so the packing party will also be out on the patio on the 7th. Um, and we still need materials for that. There's all kinds of uh, explanation of that as you go past the pumpkins um, and uh, come further on down the hall there in the narthex uh, with everything needed for Operation Christmas Child. So thank you so much. A lot of announcements, uh, but hey, it's always good to see all that activity that's going on. So if those of you, uh, yes, uh, Connie? Uh, we have an class. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, and our Inquirer class will be on November 14th. Uh, for those that are looking uh, at the church, want to know more about it, maybe want to join, uh, those of you online can also be able to get in touch with us, uh, and uh, we'll be able to uh, let you know all the details about that. So that's that announcement. And Sonia? Yes. Yes, those are all, those will be right after church, so you can go and grab a cup of coffee, sit at a table on Family Sunday and hand out candy, uh, so you can put caffeine and chocolate both together, great combination uh, to be able to do that as you meet everybody, and also the, uh, the packing party, we'll have food and everything for you so you don't pass out while you're packing boxes, uh, it's really kind of the big thing on there, so, uh, uh, but it's a fun, fun Sunday to be able to do, and, and as you see, just so much life going on. And then before we know it, it's the end of November and it's Advent. Which means your, all your Christmas stuff needs to get out. So, uh, but anyhow, <laughs> one thing at a time, right? Pastor, don't talk about it anymore. But hey, for those of you who are uh, able this morning, let's stand and, and join together in our call to worship this morning. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion... Then our mouths were filled with laughter. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Let us rejoice and give thanks. Let us continue to stand and join in our opening praise. Open the eyes of my heart.
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. All right, please be seated. Oh, you. Not today. No, no, no kids. Good morning. Let us pray the prayer of illumination. Gracious God, illumine these words by your spirit that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you would want us to be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. First reading is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Our second reading is Mark 10. I have a little comment about this. This, this story um, is in, of course, in, in Matthew, and it's also in Luke. And in Matthew, there are two blind men. And... In Luke and in Matthew, they don't say who the blind man was, whereas in Mark, they give a little bit of his genealogy even. <clears throat> anyway, Mark 10, 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. May the Lord add his blessing to his reading. Thank you, Aaron, for that reading on there. And uh, please uh, follow along in your bulletin outlines you have today because it is really kind of a, an interesting passage uh, to look at and 
uh, Aaron was right to bring up that difference. So depending on on which one of these stories you like, whether you like the Luke or whether you like the Matthew or whether you like the Mark, all of them kind of fill in pieces if you think of it at the time. But we're going to be talking today about, about sight being restored. And, and this opening question is rather interesting. I want us to think about it just for a second. What do you want me to do for you? Now, if we remember, this is the second time now in this chapter that Jesus has asked this question to someone. The response is how we all should respond if Jesus would ask us this question. The man who is blind replies that he wants to see. And if you think about it, sight is important. Um, If you're worshiping with us online, you are seeing us and you're here so you can know what's going on unless... Maybe you do have a sight impairment and you're listening to us. Those things can be on there. But, uh, you know, most of us, we try to get a a seat at an event where we can see, right? We don't have a tall person in front of us or we don't have a whole group in front of us. There's this real sweet spot that we know if we order those tickets in this seat, we'll never have to worry about anything. You know, it's not always what's closest to the concession stand or anything. It's line of vision, right? You want to know what's going on. And so sight is important for us. And... But even with our technology of today, we still have a problem with blindness in the world. Think of that. The U.S. National Library of Medicine's Medical Encyclopedia states that there are uh, some leading causes of blindness or vision loss. For some reason, blindness is being removed from 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 books so it's now vision loss uh, in the United States and these are the major reasons maybe some of you have went through these accidents or injuries that's like the number one reason for what causes blindness diabetes it's another one that causes blindness glaucoma or macular degeneration I was really surprised that being born blind was not very high on the list that's not something that that happens a lot And according to these various sources, along with this encyclopedia, there are approximately 1.4 million children worldwide who suffer from issues of blindness. These are the physical statistics. But what about spiritual blindness? That's really the, the thrust of this story today. Not the physical blindness we've seen, but the spiritual blindness. Because to be able to live out our lives of service for Jesus Christ, we have to see where the people's needs really are. Bartimaeus wanted to see. Jesus healed him. Inside, and out. That's really the key that we look at. And then gave him an order. Jesus loved doing this. Jesus would do something for someone. Now you need to do this for me. And what he said was, go. Go. And show people what's going on. That's important for each and every single one of us to remember because what we have been given by Jesus Christ, what each and every single one of you here today have, and those of you that are worshiping online, what you have is not to be expected to be kept. It's expected to be given away. That gift that each and every single one of us is given is to be given away as we serve in the name of Jesus Christ. So if we're going to look today at our sight restored, how does that happen? Well, it happens first when we re, uh, it requires us asking for mercy. That is how it works. For any of you with sight issues, I'm sure, I'm going to take this off because my trifocals are keeping me from seeing right with everything here. But anyhow, I'm sure that Mercy was not something you heard mentioned when you went to the optometrist, right, for your sight issues. I never, ever remember that with the glasses. Maybe I said mercy after I was paying for my glasses. But, you know, it was the idea of mercy was not a requirement. Um, Maybe they told you that you needed glasses. 
Everyone remember the first time you were ever told that? Yeah, I was in third grade. And the big deal back then in the early 70s was, oh, you need to, you're reading a lot, you're a student, you need bifocals. Great, give glasses to a third grader, and then, you know, you go from, you know, you know this, the words that were said about us and everything. Um, you know, that's all, all the things, the names that you were called if you wore glasses and all that. So, so maybe you were told you needed glasses. Or maybe your parents didn't want you to do the glass thing, and they actually said, ah, oh, if he mentions glasses, you can do contact. Remember when those came out, you know, if you, had, if you had contacts, no one knew. No one knew if you had seen problems, you know, until you got hit too hard and the contact popped out when they were the hard ones or whatever. You know, then there would be an issue, but beforehand. Or maybe your optometrist said you needed surgery. Some of us had that, whether it's cataract surgery or, or uh, LASIK surgery or PRK surgery, any of those different surgeries that are on there. Those are ways, but, but never mercy. What does that mean for our story today? Well, to fully understand this aspect of him asking for mercy, we have to go back to the beginning, and that's to look at where this story happens. So we're going to go to Jericho. Now, in the Old Testament, the city of Jericho, the original city, was destroyed by the Israelites in the book of Joshua. We read about that destruction. And so it stayed destroyed for quite a while. But it was in a prime location, So then when a certain leader by the name of Herod the Great, he gave himself that title. Everyone else had different names for Herod. He called himself Herod the Great. When he ruled over Palestine, he rebuilt the city, about a mile south of where the original city had been, uh, as a site for his winter palace. Now there is a reason for this, because Jericho was a popular and wealthy resort town by the time his palace was built. Let's consider it the Tahoe of its day. It was a resort town. And you went there for certain reasons and certain things. And so, so it was very, very popular. It was along uh, the, uh, the Jordan River, and it was about 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem. Far enough away that you could say you got away. Well, back then, 18 miles was a long distance away. It was like going a couple of hundred miles for us today. But anyhow, this is Jericho, and and this is where Jesus and his disciples are going. We do not know if, if from this story if the disciples and Jesus stayed there overnight, but that we do know this, according to all three accounts, and especially here in Mark, is, is that Jesus left Jericho with a crowd following him. He always had crowds around him. He could never get away from people. Uh, except if he'd go away to pray. Isn't that something, you know, that's, even today, you mentioned prayer, not very many people come up. Jesus goes and gets away to pray. There's no crowds around him. So, so it's this idea of, of this area. And so they're following him, and a contrast is set in place in our story. There's a huge contrast here. Jesus, with this large crowd around him, comes upon one lone beggar. A crowd? One lone beggar. That's the, that is the scenario, this contrast that we have. And since it was a rich resort town, beggars were common. They wanted to be able to get something for nothing from those that had something. That was what they were there for. They were outside of the city, whether it was health issues, whether it was whatever it may be, going in and, into uh, Jericho, going out, there was always beggars around. Now, the interpreter's Bible describes this scene, and I I love my copy that I have in my office. Um, It's a rather large set, and and I have one that was published in the 1950s. And amazingly enough, over my 27 years of ministry, it has never steered me wrong with commentaries, and it's actually sometimes still been better than some of the newer commentaries that are out there. And so in this, uh, it states this about this scene. It says, it is tremendously impressive to see Jesus turn his attention from the many to the one. No crowd was ever big enough to blind him or to render him deaf, meaning Jesus. His was not only an an amazingly sensitive ear and eye, there was evidence of something deeper. The priority gave to persons, to any person, 
at the point of need. On his agenda, one beggar, single-handed, that could put everything else to flight. As a servant, and that's what we read last week, right? And we preached about that, that Jesus is our example. We are called to, when we're Christians, the next word is there is servant. That's part of our title. Why? Because Jesus, that's who Jesus is, the ultimate servant. So as a servant, Jesus was always ready to give. Can we say the same today? In the midst of all of our busy lives crowding around us, are we able to sense the need of one person who really needs the touch from Jesus? hard question, isn't it? Are we able? Can we, if we, we can, if we are consistently focused upon the servant? That's how we're able to do it. On our own, we're not. It is very hard for people to multitask. Now, you see books all the time about how it's easy and everything else and stuff, but for those of you like myself, who is a type A individual, you can only go so far on multitasking before everything starts to go away. So Jesus was able to take all the busyness, tune it out, to be able to focus on the one. And they were never at a distance. They were always right in front of him, if you notice. He didn't focus on somebody from afar. He got right up to them and put his full attention and focus upon them. We can do the same only, only if our eyes are always focused upon him. That's how we're able to do it. The beggar in this story has a name. Aaron brought up an interesting point. In Matthew and Luke, no name. Think about all the no names within the Bible that proved to be so very important. The woman at the well had no name. We don't know her name. Very, very important to our spiritual lives and to the ministry story of Jesus. But for some reason, Mark knew that this beggar had to have a name. And his name was Bartimaeus, Bar, which means son of, and then Timaeus, Bartimaeus. That's how we get the name. He's sitting there hearing the people go by. He's blind, right? So he can do nothing else but just sit there and hear the people go by. He hears the name of Jesus of Nazareth uh, spoken. Ding, 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 ding. Radar starts going off. Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus going by me? Just think of all the things going through his head. Because he's heard everything when he's sitting there. I mean, that's like the best intel source that anybody could ask for is somebody that people ignore and just walk by but keep talking all the time. So he has heard that name in the crowd. And so what does he do to get his attention? He shouts. Let's look at the, uh, let's look at the scripture here. So I'm going to kind of give an illustration. Bartimaeus is sitting here. He's just sitting. He hears the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I had to shout. Because that's how we do it. So I'm going to ask all of you to read this along with me, because I think it will be very cathartic. But... Let's read verse 47 together. When he heard that it was Jesus, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, is that story totally different now? You gotta, you've got to read the scriptures with the emotions that are in it. Because this is when we start understanding a little bit more of what's going on. After the first time he does this, the people do the automatic thing. It's kind of like what we are with our kids, you know, when they act up at the restaurant. Shh, shh, you know, you take them to the bathroom to get them all quiet and everything. And even the disciples are saying, hey, dude, be quiet. You know, do you know who's around here? We don't need to hear you. They're, they're treating him like they would any beggar. And so he says, I'm going to shout again. And so he shouts again one more time. Son of David, have mercy on me. Once wasn't enough. He did it again. Bartimaeus, in that shouting, was not being rude. He was being very respectful. 
he uses the title Son of David for Jesus. Believing, letting Jesus know, I believe that you're the coming Messiah. I'm going to give you your name. You are the Son of David, what everybody was talking about. He then asks for mercy. What's meant by that request? You know, you don't see that very often nowadays. By asking for mercy, Bartimaeus is asking for God's grace. R.C. Sproul, a Reformed theologian, um, has this description of what mercy or grace means. He says, the merit of Christ comes to us by grace through faith. Maybe you've heard that line before, grace through faith. Grace is unmerited favor of God. It's an action or disposition of God toward us. He is asking for Jesus' favor. Don't look at me as a beggar. Look at me as one of your creation. That's really what he's saying. Don't look at what you see. Look at who I am. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever wanted to tell somebody that? Quit looking at what you see and see me for who I am. That's what he was asking for. I'm not a beggar. I'm a man who wants to be able to do something. I don't like where I'm at. I don't want to be here anymore. And you're the only one that can do something to change that. That is what is so powerful, everybody, about this passage. This is you and me in that person right there. Because I can't imagine that any of us have not had at least one time in our life where we've wanted to grab somebody and do that, shake somebody. You know, quit looking at what you see and look on the inside. Look at who I really am. In the culture of that day, the blind were treated worse than dirt. And the sad thing was the Jewish people we're told in the Old Testament that you needed to treat them in a very respectful way, and they had even forgotten that. They had forgotten their own commandments of how they were supposed to treat the poor, the blind, the indigent, everything else. They, were they had totally written that off. And that was in Jewish law. All Bartimaeus wanted was to be seen. Having our sight restored, everyone, requires more, though, than just mercy from God. It also requires knowing what we want when we finally get it. <sighs> Have you ever walked into a fast food place, hungry beyond hungry? Maybe you've been on a road trip and you finally get an exit that has a restaurant. And you get there and you're standing in line and you walk in, oh great, I can hardly wait. I'm ready for a burger, I'm ready for some fries, I'm ready for a soda. And there in front of you is that one person who acts like they've never, ever been in a fast food restaurant. And they're standing there going, oh, I don't know. Does that come with fries if it's the meal? Um, can I not have lettuce on my sandwich? Oh, it's a cheeseburger. It doesn't come with lettuce? Okay. You know, and they're just going on here and acting as if the world just is not going to move very quickly at all. And you're sitting here going, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And now you become hangry. You ever heard that term? You're so angry, you're hungry, or you're so hungry, you're angry, whichever one. And you're just about ready to throw that person out of the line and go, give me my food. You know what you want. You want to be fed. You want those things on there. And so, sometimes the biggest person that standing in line in front of us, keeping us from getting what we want, is us. Sometimes we are that person standing in front of ourselves that doesn't know or what they want. Maybe all our lives we've been told we can't do something, and that's what is standing in front of us from being able to ask Jesus for what we want. Maybe it's because of our age. Maybe it's because of our race. Maybe it's because of our sex. Maybe it's because of our financial situation. And all those things are in our head. I can't ask Jesus for that. I'm not worthy. And so we end up 
not asking. We become that person in line who does want something, but we don't know if we can ask. What if Jesus says no? That's usually the biggest one that keeps us from asking, right? What if Jesus says no? My philosophy is always the answer is always no until we ask. That's always the answer. No is always the answer if you don't ask. So we don't. We don't ask of God. And our lives never get changed. But not so with Bartimaeus, we read. We see here in verse 51, Jesus asked him the question, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I just want to see. I just want to see. James and John answered Jesus' question the wrong way the first time. They wanted something to make them great. They wanted to sit at the right hand and the left hand of, of Jesus up in heaven. It was all about them. There was nothing in there. Bartimaeus is totally different here with his response. He specified his need and declared his faith for all to hear. Instead of teacher, he called Jesus rabbi, which means dear master. That's really kind of a, a, a very term of respect. Um, yes, that was Jesus' title, but it wasn't used all the time, and so teacher was used a lot. Um, it's kind of like most people don't call me reverend, but that's really kind of like the more endearing term of reverend as opposed to pastor. Pastor is the everyday general term of who I am, what I do, and then like the official, when I sign in every, anything, it's reverend. Same thing with rabbi. This was a sign that, that, that he had total respect for Jesus. So after yelling at Jesus two times, Jesus stops and asks Bartimaeus what he wants. Jesus is ready and giving his complete attention. He's like right up to him right now. Because he's blind, Bartimaeus could sense that Jesus was right in front of him. Maybe Jesus was reaching out, had his hands on him, maybe on his shoulders, maybe even grabbed his hands. I don't know. That's what we can ask when we get up to heaven, right? That list of 50 kabillion questions that we all have when we finally get up there to fill in all the lines. Um, you know, that's kind of up there. But, but Jesus is there right in front of him, giving his complete attention, and Bartimaeus is ready too. I want to see is not just a request for physical sight. That'll be great. But he wants more. It's a declaration of faith for him as well. And Jesus acknowledges that with his reply. Do any of you know someone who as soon as they know what they're supposed to do, they start doing it? Ever been there? Someone tells you this is what needs to be done, and before you know it, it's already done? Well, that is how Bartimaeus responds when Jesus gives his answer here, because this last part is immediate action. That's what we're looking at, is immediate action. That is how we have our sight restored, is immediate action. And in verse 52, we see it played out. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Faith, we read, is the most important ingredient in making sure that someone's sight can be restored. Jesus knew Bartimaeus' heart, just as he knows yours and my heart. And he could see that this was a man of faith, and that's why he let him know that his faith was what had healed him. And Bartimaeus was grateful enough that he immediately got up. Now again, this is in Mark, and I've shared before, everything about Mark is immediacy. When we see any story about Jesus, it usually comes with a phrase, and he went, and then he went, and then he went. Everything is movement, everything is immediate. And that's really what we see here. He gets up and he follows Jesus. It's like, ooh, I can see, I'm going to go in town and see what town looks like. No, he just follows along with Jesus. 
I've been outside this resort town all this whole time, and I've never seen it. You'd think he'd want to go do that, right? No, that's not his response. He wants to know more, so he's going to follow along with Jesus to learn. He, when you don't, when you got Jesus, you don't need this, right? So he's right there. He has the walking Bible right in front of him, and so he gets his sight, and he starts following him. That was important to Bartimaeus. What's important for you and me? What would you immediately do if your sight had been restored? This is where we start looking at the spiritual sight question. There's the physical sight. Yeah, you want to go to all these neat places and see all these things. Um, But when our spiritual sight is restored, what do we do? Because, you know, even Christians lose their sight. Our spiritual sight. The cares of the world get in the way of what God wants us to see, and so things get missed by us, even by pastors. Balls get dropped. Things get in the way. Our sight shifts for a moment, but we can get back on track. Important things for the kingdom start coming back into focus. We focus on things of the world so much sometimes that um, we get what's known as tunnel vision. That's why I've encouraged you guys not to watch the news on Sunday morning. Because you walk in and your, and your minds and your brains have been very, very narrowed, depending on which broadcast you watch. Whether liberal, conservative, in the middle, whatever it is, things get narrowed. And you can't see out beyond. Your peripheral vision has been blinded. And so by coming to church open-minded with your sight open, you're able to see where we need to go next. That's really the unique thing about it. Whether you're worshiping online, in person, however it's done, when you're gathered with other believers, your sight is being restored. And we're able to focus on those things that God needs us to focus on. Here's some examples on how sight has helped us as a people of God. Five years ago, there was a need in Bethel Island. Truthfully, that need's been there for a long, long time, uh, and not a lot of people had been reaching out to do it. But our eyes were finally opened to be able to see. How were they opened? A $5,000 grant was given to this church by the presbytery to go and do ministry that if you didn't have this $5,000, you wouldn't be able to do. So I tasked every single elder to come up with an idea for ministry. You know who won. Jenny came up with the best idea that every elder agreed with, and we started the free market ministry. Our site had not been over there. It kind of had. The food pantry had been kind of going over there, but not at that level. Why? Because we didn't have the means to be able to meet the need. But God opened up our vision through that gift of money. And then Jenny went and talked to Pastor John, and then we went and talked, and it's just kind of snowballed since then. Five years, moving on number six. We're giving Jenny a few weeks off before we start talking about next year. But, you know, it's this idea of of our sight had been narrowed, we hadn't thought about this, and God opens things up. It was over 18 years ago that our eyes as a church were opened to the need of the community for a Christian school and all God's children was born. Over time, our eyes have been opened to new opportunities for ministry, and we were told that our trailers, well, there's just, we can't repair them anymore to be able to meet the requirements. And so now there's a need. Our eyes have been opened, and amazingly enough, we see that God provides, just as he did for the widow, with the oil and the flower, and was able to meet and supply all those needs, God will be able to supply our needs. Why? Because there are things needed. Children of future generations will need classrooms to be able to to learn not only about God, but also about reading, writing, and arithmetic, those things that help us to move forward in life. There may be people that are dealing with substance abuse issues through either AA or other groups that need a place to be able to meet here in Discovery Bay, and we'll have new 
rooms for them to be able to meet in and so that they'll be comfortable and we'll be able to provide for those needs as a church. And maybe you have a Bible study that outgrows your home that you're meeting it in and you'll be able to come to church and be able to use one of the classrooms to be able to have a Bible study. You know, the needs are there. Our eyes are being opened to what needs to be done. That's ministry. That's how God does it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why we are called servants. Servants are those that eyes are constantly open, hands are constantly at the ready, and their feet are already moving toward the need that is there. That's what Jesus is calling us to do as a people of God. He is calling us to go out and serve. Why did Bartimaeus want to see? Because he knew that God had a plan for his life and it wasn't sitting outside of the city of Jericho begging for dollars. That was not what God had in plan for him. God had something bigger. I don't know what happened to him after this. All we know is is that Jesus made an impact on him at that moment, just as Jesus makes an impact on each and every single one of us each and every single time we do. So God healed him physically and spiritually. And I pray that we are healed too. Healed to be the servants with sight to see the ministry needs that God has in store for us today, tomorrow, and further into the future. Amen. Amen. Let us continue now on with our worship this morning through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Gracious God, we do indeed thank you for these gifts that have been given by your servants, Lord. Lord, help us to open our eyes to where these gifts need to go, to the people that need to be ministered through them, and Lord, most importantly, to your mission out to this world that needs to be fulfilled. So we thank you, Lord, for these gifts and all that they entail, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, if you're part of the prayer chain, you've probably seen it was a pretty busy week this week with a lot of prayer requests, so I'm going to kind of put some things out there, and, and uh, uh, Jeannie, I don't think you'll have to add too many unless there's some here in the thing, because I'm kind of going off of my list that we've had, uh, but we need to lift Don Sarkozy in, in our prayers. Uh, he had a short stay in the hospital this week uh, with a UTI. Um, and so he is back home resting comfortably with a lot of antibiotics. Uh, I gave a call yesterday, talked with Jan, and uh, she goes, yep, she goes, he's sleeping away now. So uh, had his breakfast and his meds, and he was doing that, so that was good to hear. Uh, Arnold McClellan is back home after another uh, stay in the hospital. He st after we were talking last week, he stayed further to about Tuesday um, and um, was able to come home on Wednesday. And so Jerry... Uh, 
and I have been back in, uh, in connection, and she uh, said that he is um, starting to heal up more and more and not having to deal with some of his issues of the sundowners that he was having in the hospital, so that is very, very good. If you have not heard this one, this is kind of one. Uh, Bernadine Sparks' granddaughter, Melody, uh, has been in the hospital this past week. Um, she had been sick the week before, uh, went into the emergency room, was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, was placed on the ventilator for a few days, and was removed from the ventilator Thursday, and is now in a room, a private room, healing up. Uh, the good thing is she's about 21 years old. Um, the bad thing is, is she had to go on the ventilator for a while, and being a professional singer, uh, those are some issues that you just really need to pray about. So keep uh, Melody in, in your prayers. Uh, Nancy and, and Diana are going back and forth all the time on, on uh, texting just to kind of keep updated. And if you follow them on Facebook, you can be able to kind of get updates as well. Violet's been putting out updates uh, to let everyone know how things are going on. Uh, Larry Green uh, um, is going to be needing uh, radiation for three months after he completes his rounds of chemo. Uh, so just definitely keep Larry in your, in your prayers and Pat as well. Um, Jim uh, McKenzie's daughter, Teresa, um, went in for an ablation yesterday, and, or, and everything went fine and is good to go and back home. Uh, so that is a good thing as well. So we'll be keeping her in prayer. Um, I shared last week uh, about the AGC uh, um, mom who uh, lost her mom. Uh, a week ago, um, Sally, uh, Amy Singh's mother, Sally, uh, passed away suddenly from cancer, or uh, passed away from cancer, and has a third grader and a kindergartner here at AGC. So we just need to keep them in prayer. I counseled with Amy and her husband, Chris, uh, this past week um, and let them know that we are here for them as a church for anything that they may need uh, throughout this time. Uh, Gail Frischley is home from the hospital um, and uh, doing better. I'll be in touch with them here uh, these next few days. And then Connie B. Connie B. Um, has uh, been diagnosed with extreme osteoporosis and is starting the trek of um, medications for that. Uh, that all came about from her accident way back in 2002, um, as well as having epidurals for her knee and back. So. With that, uh, are there any other prayers or praises that anyone would like to lift up this morning? Diana. Okay. Yep. So Diana's childhood friend Stephanie, uh, next door neighbor growing up as kids, uh, had a heart attack uh, here this week and so is healing up from that. So we need to keep Stephanie in our prayers. Uh, anyone else this morning? Not seeing anything else. Well, I truthfully think that we do need to say a praise for this rain. Um, I think for those that have family members that are firefighters or, or anything that have been dealing with this, uh, we just need to pray that uh, um, what they've been saying on the news is correct, that uh, this should help the rest of this fire season. Um, and, um, and so definitely we need to be thankful for that. I know the farmers are appreciative of it uh, and that, so we can pray for that, pray for safety for anyone out driving with that. Um, and seeing nothing else, I think we need to, oh, yes. Amen. 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 How many years? I will be married for 56. 56. Ah. Since I was 18. Mm. There we go. Well, we'll be thinking of you on Tuesday. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Oh, well, with that, let us, uh, let's go to the Lord in some silent prayer. Uh, I think that's very, very important. Um, and uh, then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer after I'm done lifting up these concerns. So let us pray.
loving God, what a treat this morning to hear the pitter-patter of rain on the roof, knowing that you have provided uh, to repair our roof and to keep us all nice and secure inside this space. Lord, we are just so grateful uh, for those that have the skills and talents to uh, make things waterproof, but more importantly, Lord, for all those that, that gave to this need, Lord, we are just thankful. We're also thankful that this rain means hopefully a uh, slowing down of any possibility of more fires this year. And Lord, that farmers are able to uh, look up and give a praise and a thank you uh, to uh, the much needed uh, rain upon the fields around us. Lord, you are so amazing on how you take care of us and how you watch out for us. And no matter what the need may be, all we have to do is ask that question of what we need. And you are there for us. As we ask in faith, God, we know that you will hear us. And Lord, that you will move amazing things to make things happen. So Lord, today we ask in faith, knowing that you are watching out for our members that have been in need and continue to need your healing touch. We pray that you be with Don as he continues to heal after his short stay in the hospital. We pray that the infection goes away soon and he's able back to be here at church and to do all that he loves to do. Lord, for Arnold, uh, we just ask that you continue to uh, strengthen him throughout this time and, and be with Jerry as she cares for him. Lord, for Melody, Lord, she's still in the hospital. We pray that she soon will be able to go home, uh, that they will find the right medications to be able to help her uh, with this uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Lord. Uh, we pray for her voice, uh, Lord, that it will return and that strength will come to this uh, amazing young woman. For Larry, Lord, as he continues to go through chemo and now prepares for radiation, give him strength, Lord, strength of mind, body, and spirit. Be with Pat as she cares for him. For Teresa, Lord, as she heals from this angioplasty, Lord, just pray that... Uh, uh, all things continue to knit together inside her heart, and she's able to get the strength back in the heart muscles that are needed, and, and the speed of her heart will be what it's normally supposed to be. Lord, for Amy uh, Singh and, and uh, her husband Chris and their children, their two daughters, Lord, as they continue to grieve the loss of her mother Sally, we just ask that you be with them. Help them now to uh, know of your love and your grace. Most importantly, Lord, that uh, they have a church family that's lifting them in prayer and is, is uh, beside them throughout this time. For Gail, Lord, as she continues to heal at home. For Connie, Lord, as she uh, continues to uh, wait for insurance. But Lord, we pray that you have that all in hand so she'll be able to start receiving the treatments she needs for her bones here. Um, and she's able to uh, get this osteoporosis in check so that she too can be healthy again. Lord, for Stephanie as she continues to heal from her heart attack. And Lord, for memories. For memories of 56 years together. What an awesome time. We just ask, Lord, that uh, you bring healing and hope and love and peace. For all of us, Lord, I pray for renewed sight. Open our eyes to what it is that you need us to see as a people of God. As we continue to move forward with our building campaign, Lord, and with uh, all the various tasks that are upon us as a church, let us never lose sight that you are the great provider. You have, a cattle, you have cattle on a thousand hills that are able to provide our needs. And Lord, all we need to do is ask. And we are asking, not just for us, we are asking for those that will come after us so that they too can be able to sit in these pews and be able to learn of you and to grow closer in their relationship to you, that they can be able to send their children to All God's Children Christian School and be able to experience not only the basics of reading and writing and arithmetic, Lord, but also the love of Jesus Christ in a loving and, and, and just an amazing atmosphere, Lord, of, that this school provides. Lord, that we're able to reach out to the community through support groups, that we're able to go out to Bethel Island and be able to help meet the needs of those 
who except for, except for your grace could be us. Lord, we ask that you help us see where those needs are at. And then, Lord, empower us. Empower us to be your servants, to go out and meet those needs any way possible. And Lord, when our words are hard to come by and we don't know what to say anymore, we do thank you for this prayer that your Son taught us and we now lift up together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before I close, you're more than welcome to stay for fellowship. We have goodies in the fellowship hall. We can go out onto the patio and be able to enjoy. We've got cookie dough so you can be able to have cookies at home for the holidays. So many good things to be able to have. But go in God's peace. Keep your eyes open to see exactly what it is that God needs us to do as his servants. And have an amazing week. In God's love and peace, amen. Thank you.